Alright guys, so today we're going to be talking about Dying Light 2, the sequel to 2015's infamous Dying Light. I want to start off by saying this is going to be a scripted video, and it's partially the reason this took so long to get out. Uh, make sure you guys let me know down in the comments if you prefer this format, or my shorter format, more off the dome reviews. This video is also going to be broken up into segments, it'll be down in the description and on the play bar down at the bottom. So feel free to skip around and skip segments you don't really care about, like for the first couple minutes of the video I'm going to talk about the first game if you know a lot about the first game and don't need a refresher of what made it so good and all of that, you can go ahead and skip that section. All of that will be down in the description so you can jump around as you please. But let's go ahead and get into it. But to understand what doesn't work in Dying Light 2, it's important to first talk about what made the first game so great. I briefly touched on the first game in my first impressions video, but for this video I think it's important to go more in depth. Dying Light is an open world zombie action adventure game that specializes in brutal combat and parkour. There are hundreds of these zombies games out there, typically they fall into one of two genres. Call of Duty style wave survival where players are put into a relatively small map and tasked with surviving as long as possible. That rivaled only by objective level based like Back for Blood, Left for Dead, Rainbow Six Extraction type games. Dying Light filled a new space in the genre by combining what those two ideas already do really well with great open world game design. The first problem you face when giving a player a large space to traverse is keeping the player entertained while getting from point A to point B. While just existing in the world might excite the player in the beginning, after a handful of hours, more will be needed to keep things fresh and interesting. This is where parkour comes into play in Dying Light. While the abilities given to the player are limited at first, locked behind a skill tree, they still rival some of the best movement systems ever created. Allowing players to jump between buildings, scale up and down them, slide down them, and a whole bunch of other things that are unlocked later that we'll get into more when we talk about Dying Light 2. This keeps the non-action oriented sections of the game still fun, even on repeated playthroughs. This brings us to the combat of the original game. While this was less perfect than the parkour, it's still one of the most gruesome and satisfying melee systems to exist. But the game starts you with weak weapons like tire irons and pipes, which feel like trying to chop down a tree with a pair of scissors when fighting some of these zombies. You were eventually given swords, machete, axes, as well as blunt weapons that obviously one-shot the affected eventually. This combined with the modding system made the game's combat fun while still challenging at times. With different enemy types requiring different play styles, you were constantly changing up your loadout and equipment. Perhaps the biggest change from the first game to the second game is the use of guns. While guns don't make an appearance until well past the halfway point in the first game, they are completely absent from the second aside from a makeshift gun. While the gameplay between the two titles is relatively similar, when it comes to the story the similarities end. The first game features a very focused story split between two main plot points, that of the survivors and the relationships you make along the way as you traverse the world, and your original objective as the undercover GRE agent to recover those top secret files involving the virus. Throughout the first game, these two plot lines are intertwined with one another in a coherent story. The main struggle of the second game, spoilers. The familiar yet new gameplay mechanics to the genre combined with compelling story and impressive graphics that still hold up today or made the first game so great. While this is a scripted, more essay style video, I still want to format this part of the review as I typically do, breaking down each part of the game, giving you my thoughts on each section individually, and then combining it all for the final score. That being said, let's go ahead and start with bugs and just the launch of the game in general. To say Dying Light 2 had a rough launch would be an understatement to some and an overstatement to others. This section largely depends on how you chose to play this game, console versus PC and in solo versus co-op. Personally, I played on the Series X and co-op throughout my entire experience and I find it best to break it down to problems relating to co-op and then just general bugs. So as for general bugs, here's one you see here. The game is riddled with Ubisoft type glitches, whether that be enemies flying up into the air for no reason, NPCs heads doing full 360s like their necks snapping, invincible enemies, and how accepting you are of these types of bugs will largely depend on how they impact your playthrough. For the most part, they're non-game breaking, just visual bugs, but there are a few like this and invincible enemies where you literally cannot progress and have to restart. That being said, the same cannot be said for those co-op related problems. 
Dying Light 2 took me approximately a week from launch to complete, in which I had a number of hard crashes and disconnections that could only be rivaled by Cyberpunk. I believe in my Cyberpunk review I stated I had around 20 something hard crashes by the 10 hour mark. Here, roughly every hour, I would be disconnecting from my online session, causing us to both restart our game. While this problem has since been fixed, it is important to address the launch state of the game so that problems like this don't occur in future launches, hopefully. Um, other bugs include things like texture pop-ins, occasional frame rate drops, weird glitches with the day-night cycle just randomly changing, and again, while bugs like this are apparent and frustrating, they're not game-breaking for the most part, aside from the disconnection, so they don't bother me that much. So, graphically, Dying Light 2 has the inverse problem that it did in the bug section. While there is no surprise that the PC version looks and runs better than the console version, there are graphical choices made on consoles that are intriguing at best. While the PC version just has pages of graphical options that I will not even attempt to go through, the console version essentially boils down to three options. Resolution mode, which outputs in the highest possible resolution depending on your system, 1440 or 4K, or I guess if you're on the really old system, 1080p, at the cost of frame rate. Now typically this means outputting the game in 4K while locking at 30 FPS. Not my cup of tea, but understandable if that's your thing. Here, that, that's not the case. While the game does upscale to 4K in this mode, the frame rate struggles to hit 30, even on next gen. Now, I may be over-exaggerating as I consider any frame rate below 30 unplayable. That being said, turning the camera in this resolution mode makes me want to puke and is unplayable. Now, for some reason, I cannot for the life of me find this footage of me going through the three settings, and I know I did it multiple times throughout the game. So if you really care, there's a, probably a million videos out there at this point, or I know one of my streams have them. So you can watch me uh, mess with the gamma while I talk about the next setting. So next is quality mode, which can be essentially boiled down to ray tracing mode, right? It uses the same resolution frame rate lock that resolution mode does while enabling ray tracing. And I love ray tracing and it looks great on PC. If you haven't seen what this game looks like on PC, on a good PC, uh, go look at that. It's great. But when enabling this on console version, the game takes a bigger hit to your frame rate and just makes it even more unplayable. I mean, turning is impossible. And in a game where you're constantly doing parkour and moving quickly and making these split-second decisions, you need to be able to see in higher than 9 FPS. So that leaves performance mode my personal favorite and what I play most games in. This lowers the resolution while greatly increasing your frame rate to a playable 60 frames per second. Well, at first I wasn't impressed by any of the modes the game offers. As I continued and I visited more detailed areas of the world and saw more main characters, I quickly changed. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not Forza Horizon 5. This isn't nowhere near what I would consider next-gen threshold. I mean, Horizon Forbidden West just launched and that looks amazing. This is nowhere near that. Just wanted to put that out there. It looks good. It does what it needs to do, but um, it's not it's not fantastic by any means. Now, Onto the subjective side of this topic, the game uses a very different color palette than the first. While Dying Light 1 thrives in using variations of orange and brown and gray, really ugly colors, this game goes for a more vibrant approach on the rooftops covered in plants and trees, painting the whole world green, along with the overall color of the buildings just being brighter in general. Gone are those brick and sheet metal brown and gray buildings from the first game that just looked incredibly bland and ran down. And in its place are drastically colorful blue, red, green cityscapes. Unlike the resolution, textures, frame rates, all that stuff with the game's graphics, your preference here is entirely up to your personal taste. I mean, I guess you can personally like to play 9 FPS, but I don't. I tend to lean towards the dark and grim color palette of the first game, but no way does that drastically influence my score towards the game. For example, look at something like Assassin's Creed. That's really oversaturated, right? Its greens are super green, and like its yellows, it's, it's a high dynamic range of colors, right? And then this is the same thing, but then I just prefer Dying Light 1's look, where everything's just bland and the contrast is slammed all the way down, and everything just looks the samey, dark, ugly ass brown. And that has to do with the setting, 
right? Assassin's Creed, uh, just as an example, it's a very different game, very different tone than a post-apocalyptic zombie game. So, again, it's not too distracting, it's just something you have to get used to. Now let's move on to, you know, the significantly more important section for the score of the game, the gameplay. Like the first game, Dying Light 2 is an action-adventure, melee-focused story game centered around two primary mechanics, combat and parkour. The parkour from the first game makes a return heal, while most of the skills are directly copy and pasted from the first game, there are some new ones. New abilities like launching yourself off of certain objects around the world, which is drastically important to traversing, the paraglider, reworked grappling hook, as well as some essential returning abilities that help you navigate like wall running and tic tac which gets you killed 90% of the time, you know, being able to jump off of walls, all, all that good stuff. Again, like the first game, these abilities are unlocked through a skill tree in which you find hidden crates around the world to unlock new abilities. These crates are typically hidden in dark zones in which the player is given a timer until they're turned and forced to either find a UV light or use a consumable to stay human, the name of the game. This mechanic works well at the start of the game when zombies are overwhelming and you're relatively underpowered and you have very little time inside these zones, roughly about two minutes at the beginning. So the player is forced to move quickly and strategically. This becomes a problem later on as you just become insanely overpowered, but these crates are still required to level up, forcing you to go into these zones without any type of threat. You have such a long period of time within these zones throughout the upgrades that you get by opening crates, and you're so overpowered with your weapons that the zombies inside them are no longer a threat. Now with Dying Light 2, perhaps the biggest change is how night is handled. You are no longer hunted down by hordes of virals, but normal zombies combined with the threat of your UV timer. Again, while this is a fun mechanic in the beginning, because you're overwhelmed by the zombies and everything I already explained, it causes the player to move from UV zone to UV zone. It gives a point to what we'll talk about later with the open world activities, unlocking these safe zones with the UV lights, so you have safe places to go to and refill your timer. But as the game goes on and your timer increases and blah, 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 this becomes pointless. So that's the parkour and the traversal and just getting around the world. Let's talk about the combat. So depending on who you asked, this is probably the most important part of the game. Now, unlike the first game, you spent a lot more time doing parkour here. At least I did. I remember the first game fighting hordes and hordes and hordes of zombies. You're constantly in combat, constantly having to fight zombies. For me, after about maybe the, the 40, 50% mark, I really stopped fighting zombies and just traversed through the map, just avoiding them as much as possible. Because while your progression is linked to zombies and attacking them and getting points through combat, much like it is parkour, it's also linked to these crates we've talked about. So it ends up just making combat not as essential to progression as it should be. So the thing that made combat in the first game so great was the diversity of weapons and equipment available to the player as well as the mods that could be equipped to those weapons. This left every weapon feeling unique and fun, so while you and your friend could both be using swords, you could have an electricity mod while theirs had a fire mod, and there were different types of fire mods, pages and pages, and lightning mods, and ice mods, and toxic, and knockback mods, and while that's all here, it's very different. You could have multiple different types of sword, multiple types of machete, multiple types of baseball bat, and here, to sum it up easily, it's all streamlined. There seems to be a lack of not only weapon types, but equipment and mods as well. Your mods are basically simplified down to two shock abilities, I believe two fire abilities, a toxic and a knockback or two that can be upgraded in different levels to perform more damage, blah blah blah. Equipment's limited to a single grenade type, a landmine, C4, and a Molotov, while the first game alone that I can think of had at least four different grenade types, and then had the mines, the C4, the Molotovs, different ten types of arrows, all that stuff. And while these systems are streamlined from the first game, the sequel introduces armor and stats on clothing, a feature that wasn't in the first game that you can kind of say makes up for it. That being said, I never felt that the clothing I was equipping made that big of a difference, or was I a fan of it? Visually, I eventually just stopped micromanaging all of the statistics of it and just picked the biggest number and, you know, didn't worry about min-maxing my build because after the first 10 hours, you pretty much have every stat unlocked and you're OP anyways. 
All that goes to say the combat itself is much like the parkour. It's largely copy and pasted from the first game, with a few new mechanics and abilities here and there. Like the ability to tackle people and infected off of the rooftops is insanely fun. The drop kick comes back. There's uh, like an Assassin's Creed or Far Cry style melee takedown where you stab one of them from behind and then can throw a knife at another one. That's insanely impractical, but it looks cool. That being said, this game seems to focus heavily on human combat. Well, there was human versus human combat in the first game, it was rarely used when compared to this game. I mean, really, it was just used when in like boss fight, hit fight minions, a couple of main missions here and there, and then when you went for the airdrops. But here, it is overhauled, it is constantly used. The human combat in the first game was unpredictable and unforgiving, and that, that's just greatly changed here. I mean, it was buggy, the way they moved made absolutely no sense. They just would bolt to left or right like a zombie. It, the movement didn't make sense. It was impossible to parry any of their attacks. Here, it's much better. The enemies telegraph their moves quite predictably, unfortunately, and they never throw more than groups of three or four at you at a time. Now, as for the difficulty, you know, that greatly impacts that but it makes it less frustrating when fighting these people. That being said, the game works best when you're thrown at the waves of the infected, with high damage weapons just slicing through them. The human combat has never been the best part of these games, and it's not the best here, especially with the lack of guns. Guns in the first game, like I said, at about that halfway point really revamped the combat, lets you fight larger waves and stronger zombies, and then completely change the human versus human combat and that's not here at all. So what are you gonna be doing with all of these new parkour and combat abilities? So while you obviously have the main storyline, which typically consists of fetch quests, there's also an open world to explore. That being said, it's very generic. It consists of Ubisoft style towers to discover, points of interest in the region, resource zones that just respawn even after you've completed them. You scavenge parts there. It's much like The Division if you've played that. They have the crafting parts that you might need. You go in, you get what you need. But the zones never disappear from your map. As a completionist, that's insanely infuriating. And perhaps the two most prevalent ones, parkour and melee challenges, and then side missions. So, as someone who consistently puts over 100 hours into Assassin's Creed games, I, like I said, I made the video on the last one, and I want to say I put like 111 into it, I 100% almost everything I play, and this layout did not work for me. I found myself never needing to go near these resource zones at all after the first couple hours of the game, especially since they don't take them off my map, and that just pissed me off. And the parkour challenges are perhaps one of the better parts of the game. They're insanely repetitive. This leaves us with the side quests and melee challenges, and melee challenges are fun, but there's, there's just not enough of them compared to the parkour challenges. I did maybe three or four melee challenges that I can remember, and I had to have done at least 50 parkour challenges. I mean, those things were all over the place. But let's talk about the side missions. So, I may be biased, but I remember the side quests from the first game being my favorite part. I say the same thing in my Assassin's Creed Valhalla review, pretty much any game with side activities and a long story that I'm into, the side content is usually the best part, even Cyberpunk, which if you know, I hate Cyberpunk, but the, the side quests significantly better than the rest of the game. As with all good side quests, they are fun and add lore to the game while giving you a meaningful reward, that part's important, for going out of your way. My god, I wish that was the case here. Side quests often consist of either one or two things. Overly long, unnecessary fetch quests to collect a woman's scarf only to deliver a joke of her singing at the end poorly, collecting mail 20-something times, or uh, people talking for five minutes about their pet fish. These are all real missions, I'm not joking. No interesting reward or backstory with these. There's one good one where you like the grandma thinks you're a kid or something. That one's decent. And it's just her fucking talking. And that's a side mission. And don't get me wrong, the first game had side quests that were also like this. But they were thrown in there with the more traditional ones, right? Like the interesting ones. If I call out the stupid ones from the first game, there's the mission where you have to get the guy's chocolate for his mom who's dead. 
that's cool, right? You have to go to the store. I think like the alarm goes off or something and all the zombies swarm you. It's a whole thing. It's really fun. There's the other stupid one with the, the twins. We have to like build stuff and you end up building like a rocket train or some shit. It's cool, right? The, the missions are interesting and they're, they're just not people standing here talking to you for five minutes. And just so the side quests are awful. So all we have left is the story, right? The, the the combat's fine. It's the same as the first game. The parkour is fine. It's the same as the first game. So far, they've done nothing new, right? It's just it's just more of the first game, which isn't a problem, right? The first game's good. It works. It's been years since the first game, so it there's been enough time. There's been a long enough gap, but you need more. You need to improve with a sequel. So let's talk about the story. Still on Jack Matt's leash. Save it for your trial, just before they cut your head off. Do you really think that's how this is going to play out, Lieutenant? Lucas's death was just the beginning. You admit you hadn't killed. Take him. Quiet. Why does his death bother you? You're not enjoying your new role. New status, new challenges, new possibilities. Don't I deserve a thank you for making this possible? Nicely put. Now enough of your crap. Copy, Pepper. I'm glad you finally joined us. Shut up, Walt. Now, give back what you stole from me. Give back the key, boy, or you will all die. Fuck! Pepper! What are you waiting for? Kill it! What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> can't beat this shit. Why are you flipping though now? He's the main character. Oh bro, we're screwed. Hey, you just what take you've it. Done. <laughs> the little boy wants to pretend he's a grown-up. But he's no grown up, just a precious little boy. Did he kill Adar? This is the one good story section in the entire game. I'm not joking. It's the one well put together cutscene, it's the one meaningful moment. It happens about 10 hours into my 35 hour playthrough, and that's it. Right? And it's, it's so rough. Uh, let, let's just get into it, okay? Dying Light 2 puts you in the shoes of Aiden Babaden, a pilgrim on a journey to find his long-lost sister. The backstory is given for this relationship throughout the main story in forms of flashbacks, as well as setting up the main villain. My god, I forgot about the flashbacks. I wrote this so long ago. The f I'm, I'm going on a rant. The flashbacks? All of the flashbacks, if you've watched any of my reviews, you know I'm going with this if you've played this game. They have just the most absurd amount of film grain you can possibly have. And I fucking hate film grain. I don't know why it's a thing. It looks awful. It, all that shit should be turned off. And if you can't turn it off in the flashbacks, I'm literally about to freak out just talking about the goddamn film grain. It's infuriating. I don't know who designed film grain, but it's awful. Alright. Often like the side missions, the story is told through a string of investigations and fetch quests which leave much to be desired. Basically, every single mission you do, go get something, bring it back. Now the first game did the same exact thing, but just with more interesting characters. A perfect example of this is towards the relative end of the game, spoilers, you are uh, forced to go shoe shopping for a character. As a main mission, this is, this is done, I mean, there's a reason for this. It's done to try to force a connection between the main character and this character that I won't name, which would be fine if, like, you went shoe shopping and it was, like, this big mall, and there were a bunch of zombies or, like, a bunch of, uh, the renegades you had to fight, and it became this big thing and this huge fight. But it doesn't. There's no main mission in this game, and I'm going on a rant again, where fucking there's just like a big thing there's the arena in the first game there's we had to blow up the building or the nest in the first game there, there's so many missions in the first game that are big events like call of duty style set pieces i can't remember a single one in this game other than the one i just showed you in the last level which is literally the halfway point 
and the end. Anyways, back on topic, they do this trying to force a connection between the player and this shoe shopping character, so that can be used for emotional weight further on. Missions like this are fine in some games and can be the best part, as they help develop characters and blah blah blah, but leaving this all to like the last five hours of the game just feels rushed. You can't put all of your development in your characters in the last five hours and then have you punch zombies for the other 25. All right, but you start in a city being introduced to the three main groups, the survivors, peacekeepers, and renegades. Well, renegades serve as the game's villains, along with the zombies, obviously. The player is given a choice between which of the other two groups to side with. While in the grand scheme of things, it really doesn't matter what you choose, different choices result in changes to the game world. Things like traps in the environment, new weapons provided to the player if they choose to side with the peacekeepers, and with the survivors if you choose to side with them as you take these important landmarks, whether it be water or power stations, you get things to help you traverse the map, uh, jump pads and zip lines and things to fall on so that you take less fall damage. And in the marketing for the game, there's a large emphasis placed on choice and how it will matter and affect the game world. While this is partially true through these upgrades, technically, like legally, you can't sue them. None of these are drastic enough to mean anything, right? The one they showed off a lot in all of the gameplay trailers and like E3 and all that stuff is the water, which is at the very beginning of the game. You can either give the water to the peacekeepers or the survivor. We're talking spoilers, we're in the story section. And it makes no difference. Like I said, there's the, the zip lines and the landing pads, blah, 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 and the weapons and the traps. If you choose the peacekeepers, that's what, that's what you're deciding. That's what you're choosing, right? which one of those uh, those upgrades to your world you want. It doesn't matter who you give the water to. It's not like now there's water in places there wasn't before. Or whenever you do the power, it drastically changes, you know, which parts of the city have more zombies because this side, you know, has power now and this side, that, that's not, none of that's in the game. All right. So about at the halfway point, back to the story, you're introduced to Walt's present day. Scientist from your past, you saw him in the film game simulator back there, who used to conduct experiments on you and your sister. He then becomes your primary source in finding more information on your sister, as well as introducing this whole secondary plotline of revenge. Now, finding your sister and your, your revenge plot now are your primary motivations driving your character throughout this game. There are other conflicts within the faction, solving them is only a means to an end. You know, there's the investigation of the Peacekeeper's death, and this whole robbery with UV lights thing, but it's just to get you to your sister and to Waltz. I'm emphasizing this because it's important and going to lead to a rant. So here we're going to get into heavy, heavy spoiler territory. So if you somehow haven't finished the game by now, which has been out for like a month at this point, it took me so goddamn long to write this script, and you don't want it to be ruined, or you, some reason, go finish it, watch the end, whatever, come back. Now, knowing I was going to make a review on this game, like I do with almost everything I play, constantly analyzing both the gameplay mechanics and the storytelling used throughout the game, the graphics, you know, all of that, those big boy words. And that being said, I was sitting at a certain score for this game for a large amount of its playtime, probably you know, those 25 hours of my 35 hours, I, I was sitting at a certain score. I don't want to say it because I don't want to spoil the fun at the end. But that's where I was sitting for a long time. And I understand what the game was trying to offer and what it was trying to do and where it was going and felt that my score was accurate and what the game was reflecting. That was until the ending. This has got to be one of the most unsatisfying endings I've ever played in my life. And I've played a lot of games. Well, I believe how much you enjoy the gameplay in Dying Light 2 is largely subjective to your experience with the first game and just zombie games in general. Same can't be said for the story, right? The story is either good or bad, right? And yeah, like there's certain elements some people might like more than others, but when I get into it here in a minute, you'll understand why. How you enjoy this game, I'll get to this again later, it largely depends on what you're looking for, right? If you haven't played the first game, then you're going to like this a lot more because all these mechanics and all the parkour stuff is new to you. If you've played the first game, especially like me a lot of times, it's a lot of repetitiveness, so you're kind of focusing on the story. So now I'm going to attempt 
emphasize, I have it ca attempt capitalized to explain the ending without raging. So if you're supposed to believe characters, whether it's in a book or a game or a movie, whatever, they have to have motivation and goals and, and, and morals, all that good stuff to make them relatable people. All right. That's like storytelling 101, right? Like you don't got to go to school for that. You should you should know that. Characters have goals that they want to achieve. That that's very simple. And something that you can be invested in. You know, this is the character. They are invested in this and this. They want this and this is why. Okay? So, as I've made sure to emphasize up to this point, your entire motivation as a character and a person if you're going to relate to them, is to find your sister and then at the halfway point to get revenge on Waltz and find out why he was experimenting on you, but more importantly, the sister part. And so when I play for 35 hours searching for my long lost sister, the sister to Mr. Babaden, I expect in one of the four fucking endings of the game that she will survive. And I have fucking in the script capitalized and caps locked. All right, that was spoilers, by the way. You spend so much of this game tracking down Waltz and your sister, and all you're given at the end is some mid-boss fight dialogue explaining how she is his daughter, and he was attempting to make a cure, which leaves me with even more questions. Is, is Waltz your dad, then? Is she really your sister? I have no fucking clue, and I finished the game. Now, typically games and, and movies, and, and sometimes books, I don't know how to fucking read, have problems with dumping exposition on the player view slash viewer, trying to explain things quickly and keep the pace moving. But here, it's the exact opposite. You spend 35 hours looking for your sister, and then you find your sister, and that's it. There's there's no ex explanation, right? There's a cutscene, which I already showed when talking about the film grain, where they just explain that it's his daughter and they were trying to make a cure. And then he, he spits like some nonsense while you're actually fighting him, not in a cutscene or something where you can actually listen to what he's saying in the middle of the boss fight. And I still haven't gotten to the worst part. So there's multiple endings here as that's obvious. Their whole marketing thing was choices and dialogue options. And now that I'm getting to the end of my script, I'm starting to realize I didn't talk about dialogue options. And if that reflects how important they are in the game at all, that's pretty much all you need to know. And so there's multiple endings here. I'm going to attempt to explain them without looking them up, just to show you how fucking confusing this is. So let's start with the good ending. This requires, there's basically a few, I think three or four, pivotal things that you have to do, right? If Depending on which one of these three or four choices, which are all in the end of the game, so the first like 25 hours didn't fucking matter at all. Um, those things are pretty much the only things that decide what ending you get. So let's start with, in quotes, the good ending. This requires that you keep Hakan alive. Hakan is the guy that brings you to the city in case you beat this a while ago. And there's a mission where you can go beat him up and kill him or let him live. So you have to keep him alive, right? You have to destroy the X-13 facility and then give radio control to Frank. That's the mission where you have to climb the tower and it's a big long ass mission. And then you have to decide, do you give it to Frank, the guy at the bar, or do you give it to the peacekeepers? So this results in the city being saved. These are your multiple endings, I guess. Hakan and Luan surviving, and your sister dying. So you have the constants of the tower, the facility, and Hakan. Those are your three things that matter, essentially. Right? And then your outcomes depend between Hakan, Luan, your sister, and the city. Those are the four things that change. Okay? So this is the good ending. Not not the gameplay. This is my ending. This, this is the fucking bad ending. So, then there's the bad ending, which is what I got. Here, the radio tower has to be given to the peacekeepers. The player has to choose to save the one at the end as their final choice. Which lets the missiles destroy the city. Except, in your attempt to save her, your infection takes over and you injure her, resulting in her death. So in this ending, the city is destroyed. The fucking Luan dies. Hakan may or may not be d dead, depending on what you chose. That really has no impact on this ending. Oh, and, and your sister dies. So, to get the bad ending, you pretty much have to destroy to choose the city, in which case 
if uh, you kill Takan, then Luan dies. This is too many names, and your sister dies. That one's that's important. Remember that. And the city, everybody dies. So that's the bad ending. That's what I got. And these are essentially the two endings. And then there's just different variations. Do you save Luan? Does Hakan save Luan? Do you destroy the city with Hakan dead? Do you destroy the city with Hakan alive? You know, do you not destroy the city with Hakan alive? It basically just, do you destroy the city? And do Luan or Hakan live? Now you notice, you know, I went through that whole section, like a fucking page and a half of my script about character motivation, why that's important, and your whole motivation that I brought up multiple times throughout this video, being your sister and, and trying to save your sister and and find out why Waltz was doing those experiments and, and all, all that stuff, you know, like you, the whole reason you're playing the game. Yeah, fuck that. They don't, they don't give you anything. That's it. And what they're going for, I know what they're going for, right? Because of the choice they give you. The actual final choice is save Luan or save the city. Those are your two options that you are given. There's not even an option to save your sister. So what they want from the game, what they expect you to go through, is to go through this whole thing, oh, but the people of the city, and you fall in love with the people of the city, and you find the one her fucking shoes, so you're in love with her now, and you, you decide that, oh, well, my, the people in the city and the greater good is better than my personal reasons for getting answers with Waltz and reconnecting with my sister, but it's not. That's your whole dude's motivation. You're not a good person. So... Throughout these multiple endings, and you can say however many you want to say there are, depending on, you know, who survives and dies, but really, really there's two. The only slightly good ending, your sister makes it out of the facility, if you don't blow up the facility, obviously, and then just dies a few hours later anyways. So like I said, you're choosing between saving Lawan and saving the city, and this would be fine. If, like, the first game you had a small group of friends that were all looking out for each other and seemed to generally care about each other and, you know, were good people and I knew any of their names, but here, everyone's acting on their own accord and except for taking the one shoe shopping, like I said, there's no, like, interpersonal relationships and even, you know, the shoe shopping mission is a surface level and just exposition dump to get you to care about it at the end of the game. And so, what they decide to do is go for the typical hero ending do you save the person that you love quotation marks like nine of them or the the city with the the mass numbers of people but that goes against your character motivation i know i've said it like fucking nine times at this point but this pissed me off so much like this drastically changed my score for the game but that's it so this shit ending results in unsatisfying just drop off at the end of the game, leaving a bad taste in the player's mouth as their final interaction, right? Your, your, your ending needs to be good. You need to wrap everything up. That's going to be the thing that people remember. Look at like, oh, I'm going to get so much hate for this. Look at Infinity War, right? Infinity War, everyone remembers the end. End game. End game's a better example. End game. Everybody remembers the end fight. The last hour of the movie. Post the greatest thing ever, 10 out of 10. The first hour of that movie isn't that good. But everyone remembers the end. It's what you need to do in your game. Right? I'm not saying the beginning should be shit. But if you're going to have a good part and a bad part, the end needs to be your good part. And no. Now, if you don't care about the story, right? This is what I was talking about earlier. Your opinion on Dying Light 2 is going to drastically differ depending on your exposure to the first game and how interested you are in the gameplay versus story. With no exposure to the first game at all, and heavy focus on gameplay, choosing to ignore the story entirely, which is what I would highly recommend, uh, this game can easily be like a 7 or an 8, like a good or a great. That being said, I love the first game, not only for the gameplay and the, the parkour and the combat and all that good stuff, the guns, but the story works. Like, I know characters' names, there's still jokes that I make. The game's like six years old. I still say crane on a crane on a weekly basis. There's good jokes. There's parts that are funny. There's freaking really cool sections. Like I mentioned earlier, the game ends in a quick time event. That part kind of sucks. But aside from those, it's, it's, it's really good. And then here, the story just sucks. I mean, 
give this another month. I mean, I had to remember a lot of it because I was doing a review. I guarantee I won't remember what happens in this game at all. I'll probably forget about this game. When I go do my best and worst games of the year, I'm going to forget this game even came out. Even on a gameplay level, so many of the vital components from the first game are simplified and streamlined like crafting, weapon variety, and all that stuff that just worked really well in the first game and were just ruined here and just made significantly simpler to appeal to more people, but ultimately makes things more surface level at the end of the day. A perfect example is the grappling hook. They tried to make it more complex, right? The things that they needed to make more complex, they made simple, like the crafting. The crafting menu in the first game is very confusing, but once you get it in the first couple of hours, it works very well. It's it, You can craft things, there's a lot of options, it just works, right? Here, it's all simplified and streamlined. Like, I use the same mod for pretty much the whole game. You go play the first game, you use hundreds of mods, you're gonna be constantly going through all types of equipment, you're gonna be constantly changing throughout. Here I use pretty much the same shit the entire game. I'm not attached to any of my weapons in this game. I still remember exactly what my weapon loadout was in the first game with my dope-ass katana. Here, I can't even tell you what I was using. Like, you can't repair your weapons. And so, while stuff like that was simplified, you take the grappling hook, which baffles me that they made this more realistic. The grappling hook in the first game works like it does in Halo, and I think that does have part to do with it that I just got off of playing Halo Infinite like two months ago, and that's probably one of the better grappling hook implementations ever. But grappling hook in the first game was very, you point where you want to go, you use it, and it brings you there. Here they tried to do a more realistic, momentum-based approach, and they didn't need to, right? It, it doesn't work within the world, right? There's, it's not really that useful other than when you're forced to use it, and it's pre-planned within the story and the level design and it's just not as fun. This combined with the state of the game at launch made it practically unplayable in co-op, drastically hurting my overall score of the game. So, if you decide to pick up the game now, with a lot of these problems patched out, like I said, this game could comfortably, depending on how you played the first one, what you expect from this one, could sit up at that 7-8, right, with all the bugs patched out. Personally, I struggled through all of the launch issues, I played an absurd amount of the first game. Nothing new is done here. The story is fucking dog shit. So, Dying Light 2, Stay Average, gets a 5 out of 10. I know a lot of people are going to disagree. I've only seen positive things about this game, but it doesn't do anything new, and the stuff it does new is shit. But you guys let me know what you think of this game down in the comments below. I know this took forever but I had to beat it, and then there was a lot of time-sensitive stuff that was coming out. I'm trying to play Elden Ring, but I kind of have to get past like the first five minutes so that I can make a video on it and not just be talking out my ass, but I suck. And I wanted to write a script for this just for the fun of it, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna write a little script, it'll be, it'll be this whole thing, and then it ended up being fucking 11 pages long, and that's not even including the story rant I went on in this video, that's not even in the script. So, it, it was a thing, all right? But I made the review before the end of the month. That's all that matters. Um, if you guys are still here, how fucking long is this? 45 minutes in. This is way too damn long. Make sure you comment down below. Thanks, you guys, for sticking around. If you uh, like this more than my, my typical, you know, just talking out my ass, like what I'm doing right now, style reviews, let me know down in the comments below. Um... If I don't have to rage as much like I did in this, there'll be a lot more structured, right? I mean, my, my script is very well formatted, and it has, like, sections to it. And I got to the story section, and I just fucking went off. So, um, it gets a little sloppy at the end. But if, if you liked just the general idea of this more, now it does mean that reviews take longer because, let's say the game takes me three or four days to beat post-launch, then realistically writing a script not slacking, it would take me another two or three days, so it doubles the output time of the video, but I think it does make it better overall, but you guys let me know all that good stuff down in the comments below, and I'll see you on the next one.